Hi, everybody. Welcome to another UMedia Learning Lab Network webinar. Um, we're going to be talking today about tools and materials. And the reason that this came up was because we had a lot of conversation on the COP about a couple of things like 3D printers or laser cutters. And I feel like we needed to have a conversation a little more in depth about um, not only the bigger ticket items that you may be planning to buy as uh, as the fiscal year comes to a close, but also um, I feel like we needed to also have a conversation about uh, the smaller ticket items, like things that you use every day, things that you can never seem to keep in stock, things that the kids that you're working with are using all of the time. And also, I guess, like some of the middle range things, like specific cameras that you might use and other tools and materials. So, um, and I also, the other thing that I also wanted to talk about are the things that you bought that you almost wish that you hadn't bought because I felt like there were a lot of things that at the Free Library of Philadelphia, we bought them and then they stayed in their box. And for whatever reason, they didn't get used, but I feel like it would be a great opportunity to talk about those kinds of things as well and get some ideas for how to use unusual materials and stuff like that. So I thought we could just go around and introduce ourselves and where we're from, and then we can start um, the conversation. Um, so Matt, do you want to start? Sure, thanks. Uh, so hey again, everybody. I'm Matt Baker from the Science Museum of Virginia. Um, and the space I head up is called The Mix. Um, so, you know, I'm excited to hear about this, constantly going through purchasing. Um, so I'm excited to hear what everybody else is buying or not buying, and as the case may be, and uh, share some of our experiences, too. So, glad to be here. All right, Janos, do, do you want to go next? So, Janos, you're still muted right now. How's this? Perfect. <laughs> right. My first hangout. Um, so, Janos McCutton with St. Paul Public Library up in Minnesota. And we have a teens only program called Create Pack. And that runs out of a studio, one location, six days a week. And then we have other participating sites that are once a week. Great. Sal, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, Salvador Avila, Las Vegas Clark County Library District, um, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, we have two, um, I'm going to call them STEM initiatives. Um, I was next, right, K5? OK. And um, we um, focused on, uh, we started with Learn to DJ. We realized that a lot of um, younger um, teens or youth are showing up, so we decided to do something that would attract uh, the fifth through eighth graders, because uh, we were noticing that they were being more of a distraction to the people that were attending the regular Learn to DJ. So now Learn to DJ is only for 13 through 17 year olds, um, and they learn how to master the art of DJing. And what we did with the five through eight year olds is um, we bought a ton, ton load of what's known as little bits uh, so they learn how to use that product um, in their particular space. Little bits is offered only on Tuesdays from 4 to 6. Uh, learn to DJ is every Tuesday and Thursday 3 to 5 and due to popular demand um, it's now open to, the, to adults on the first and third Wednesday of the month. Uh, from three to five, so um, so now everyone has a piece of the pie. Great. Um, I I want to get back to little bits for sure, but I also wanted to introduce Sari also. Hi, I'm Sari. I'm from the Maker John Initiative out of Philadelphia, and we use a lot, or historically we've used a lot of low cost and recycled materials. I personally use a lot of cardboard. I'm kind of a cardboard queen. Um, but we are about to make some larger tech purchases in the next few months. 
so um, yeah, I'm excited to hear what other people like, what they regret, all of that. Great. So I guess the first thing that came up that I already said I wanted to talk about were um, uh, some construction kits, like something like Little Bits. And I'm curious to see if any of you guys use things that are similar to Little, little Bits in your site and how often they get used and which kits you might have, like not just Little Bits, but I'm thinking even something like um, different robotics kits or Lego Mindstorms or um, I've heard of snap circuits being used. Is there anything like that that you folks are using? So we, we used to have just the most basic little bits kit and I found that it was really, it's really great for engaging very young kids and um, older kids, they're interested in it but it's pretty, it's pretty limited in what it can do and how far participants can go with it. Um, so I, I don't find that to be super useful, but we recently got a couple of the more comprehensive little bits kits and we've gotten a lot more use out of those uh, because there are a lot, just, there are a lot more sensors, there are a lot more pieces, um, people can go farther in the projects that they're developing. Um, we also just started experimenting with the Hummingbird Robotics Kit, and I, I think really the difference between that and the Little Bits Kit is that there's more of an element of uh, programming and using programming language. Um, we found it to be a little bit buggy, and we're trying to work out the kinks. I don't know if that's a universal thing or the particular, how you know, how the software is running on our computers or whatever else is just making it um, bug out a little bit. But otherwise, it seems like a pretty good, easy-to-use thing for beginner robotics. Um, I think I... I Oh, go ahead, Matt. Sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to kind of echo um, what Sari said a little bit. Yeah, we found the same thing with you know a small kit of little bits. It is kind of limited. Um, you know, maybe you get a little bit of basic circuit knowledge, um, but we ended up buying one of the workshop sets, which you know is is definitely more expensive and doesn't probably fit into that small purchase level um, because I think it's over a thousand dollars. But if you expand and get a workshop kit, there is a lot that you could do with a little bits. Um, yeah, we just had a student actually come in, and he loves a little bit. It's probably the first thing that he goes to every time. Um, and he integrated little bits um, with Makey Makey, and then hooked that up to his computer to play Minecraft without actually having to play Minecraft. So once you hook up your little bits and your Makey Makey, it's making contacts and making Minecraft think that you're hitting these keys, and basically it's auto playing Minecraft. Um, so he called it his Minecraft autoplay beta version. Um, so, you know, sky's kind of the limit with that. I think that's great. Um, we've gotten some really good use out of our Hummingbird kits. It's one of the first things we purchased, um, uh, I guess, about two years ago now. Um, so I would definitely recommend the Hummingbirds and the Hummingbird Duo. I think the Hummingbird Duo is pretty neat because it has the Arduino on board. Um, so we're still experimenting with that, but we've also got a couple of the, the second version of the Hummingbird. That's great to know. And the Hummingbird Robotics Kit, the price point at that is around what per kit? Uh, I think that is, correct me, Sari, if I'm wrong, but I think it's uh, about $150 to $200. I want to say $199, somewhere around there, for either kit, I think. Um, Salvador, what do you know which uh, Little Bits kit you guys have? Is it a basic yeah. kit, or is it... You know, you know, I um, I got introduced to little bits while visiting the Chicago Public Library, and um, they had the, the smallest box that cost one hundred and fifty dollars. Came back to um, Las Vegas, did some research. I actually ended up buying the Pro Library. Um, that one cost um, th uh, three thousand. Hi, how are Hi. you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Leah. Hi, Leah. Hi, Sal. 
you, you. <laughs> I'm taking over Kay Fun. <laughs> no, please, go for it. <laughs> Leo, right. want to introduce yourself and then I just had a little technical difficulties here, so <laughs> yeah, Leah Duncan, Tucson, Arizona. So one oh one space. So, Leo, we are talking about little bits right now and some basic construction kits. And Sal was just talking about the kit that they are playing with. Yeah, so we okay. purchased uh, what's known as the, the, the Pro Library. I believe it's their, um, their, their highest end product that has over 240 modules um, that kids could play with. Um, we've had that for about, um, I'm going to say, four months. And the beauty of um, little bits is that we have the same um, I guess n number of students uh, it does increase uh, one student per month so we're up to 13 the beauty of little bits and the way the staff member um, I guess champions that program is that the kids are real focused um, they don't horse around they're real serious um, they're they practice discipline. When it's time to clean up, um, they clean up after themselves. Um, and one thing that I've seen and learned by visiting many maker spaces is that, at least in the Las Vegas Clark County Library District, we do not intend on mixing formats. By that I mean uh, we're not going to buy little bits and then put a 3D printer. We're not going to buy little bits or install another makerspace um, you know toolkit of sorts we're just gonna stick to little bits um, the new fiscal years around the corner and we're gonna buy close to thirty five hundred dollars of additional accessories uh, to supplement what the kids are asking for what age are you working with um, yeah these are fifth through eighth graders only okay. no parent and no parents are allowed in the room while um, the kids are um, during that program because then the parents start interfering with the kids um, creative juices. Um, Leah, do you want to talk about um, maybe some of the favorite tools and materials that you use at 101? Um, is this working? Can everybody hear me? Or is it too loud? No, it's good? Okay. Um, We've been doing a lot of stuff lately with the vinyl cutter that we have, um, doing a lot of vinyl cutting um, sticker-wise, um, and also vinyl cutting for t-shirts. Um, there's a guy in town, uh, Reggie, I can't think of his last name. Anyway, he, he makes, uh, he turns soda bottles into t-shirts, and so the kids have been saving uh, plastic water bottles and different things and have taken them over to him and not those necessarily same bottles turned into shirts but they've been then using those shirts and making their own designs on them um, so we've been using the silhouette uh, and I think we're ready to take it another step higher and, and let them do a little bit more but the beauty of that is that it's easy to use and it doesn't um, it doesn't often break uh, it's easy to redo it if somebody's done something wrong and also you can create your own kind of thing in uh, Photoshop or whatever kind of drawing program you want to use and then transfer it to that and it will cut it and so the kids have been doing a lot of they started out doing like uh, I'm just gonna make you know some skateboard symbol on the bottom of my skateboard to actually designing something that they wanted themselves um, putting that in in adhesive vinyl or putting that on iron-on vinyl and messing around with them. So I know that some other people also have vinyl cutters. Can we talk about which one you've bought? It seems like there are a few kinds on the market. Yeah, and I'd like to know if anybody has one that's like a step up from that most basic kind. And which, which one is, do you, you know, have, Leo? The, we have the Silhouette. I don't know if that's the most basic one. No? <laughs> that's the one that I hear a lot of people um, owning. Sari, which one do you have in at the library in Philly? We, we also have the silhouette. Do you? Okay. Yep. And you haven't gone any further? 
No, not yet. I we we might um, make another vinyl cutter purchase um, in the near future, but I'm not quite sure yet what we're gonna go for. So AJ just joined our call too. Hi AJ. Hello. Um, I saw that you had asked a question earlier. Do you want to bring that back in? Oh, sure. This is for Salvador. Hi, Salvador. Hey, what's up, AJ? <laughs> um, I kinda, my question was, if you uh, if you gave prompts to your kids when they worked with the little bits, and if so, what were the prompts? Or did you just have it free play? Yeah, you know what? It's actually free play. Um, we have a monster definition TV um, along the wall. Uh, we have the little bits website in case they want to resort to um, ideas, um, YouTube it or whatever, and they just are, um, they tackle their own projects, they they start from scratch, and um, it's, you know, everything goes. Um, we do th um, have a little bucket of Legos in case they want to um, supplement little bits with, uh, you know, a little architectural design, but for the most part, it's, um, it's, it's a free range, and they do whatever it is that they want to do. So there's no limitations. Staff doesn't tell them what to do. There's no curriculum. So it's just work. That's Put great. Yeah. So it's uh, my, really next question, <laughs> my next question is, what's the like about how many little bits do each kid have? Does each kid have when you like? If you were to equally like just to get a ratio of like how many little bits you need for a size. Um. You know what? The Pro Library comes with 240 modules. I think most Whoa. kids help helps themselves to about um, 25 different. It depends on the project, and um, so because one person might need two soundboards or two lights, um, and that's where collaboration comes in place. Um, they barter, um, and, and it's real neat watching the kids um, actually have formal, intelligent discussions as to well, you know what, I need that light set. Uh, can I borrow it for today? And I promise I won't borrow it next time. Um, so there's a lot of uh, great, in, you know, interactions taking place. But for the most part, I think they all um, use about 20 to 25 pieces, um, depending on their project. Again, because some might only want six, but it's an elaborate using the sound cards, if you will, the uh, synthesizers. And for that, you only need like six plus a battery and a few other things. But so it least, depends. But at least six per kid. Maybe well, starting yeah, mi minimum six. Okay, that's good yeah. to know. The Pro Library, I just looked at the price. It's in, in Salvador, you might have mentioned this. It's about um, $3,200, $3,400. So it's definitely an investment. Like it's about the cost of, yeah, well, it's $3,200, uh, which is, you know, um, it's a lot of money, but it sounds like you guys have been using it. And I think that when you get up to those higher levels of having a lot more tools, it seems like then it becomes more useful because you have like different kinds of motors and different kinds of inputs. Yes, you, you definitely, the more you pay, the more um, options, the more advanced um, modules you'll end up getting, like um, fans, rotators, you know, fancier modules. Yes. I would also like to talk about like moving beyond the more construction kit things to some more basic things like computers, for example, because I feel like we were all talking at one point when we were all building our spaces, we were like, and we're going to have computers and we're going to have laptops, but we never really talked specifically about what kinds of laptops we were buying and or what even types of computers we were buying. So I'm curious to see what gets most used in your space and what you did end up buying. Well, I can jump in and say uh, we just got a grant to buy some stuff, so we haven't been yet. <laughs> um, as far as new stuff, we've been using um, the laptops, which I've got now. This is just a basic Dell. We had um, a couple of MacBooks, um, and we're definitely planning on purchasing more of those um, because those have gotten a lot of use. and. Um, you know, we got a state library grant to, to buy some more materials, so that's one of the things we're going to do with it. Um, my question is uh, about tablets. I wondered if anybody has been using tablets, and if so, how do they use them? Because we have some tablets. I think they're, 
uh, I can't think of it now. They're just Android-based tablets, um, but we, they don't get a lot of use, and I want to know if like we're underutilizing them, if there's cool things we could do with them. We just haven't been using them a lot. Um, I know we use uh, tablets for a few things, just to speak to that first, and then I kind of want to talk about the computers we have here, but we use tablets to fly our drones, which you can kind of see on the wall back there. Um, and that's just because the drone we got, that's the software they use. So we use them for that. We use them for um, a real quick green screen program called Green Screen Wizard, so that if we have kind of a, an open house, um, then folks can come in, you know, non-mixed members, but anybody who's coming in can take that iPad really quick, um, take a shot of somebody in front of the green screen, import that background, and, and then email it to themselves as, you know, kind of a, a momento um, of of their, their time with the science museum and more specifically the mix. So, um, you know, we use iPad 2s. I think we're looking at um, updating those to iPad Airs or iPad Minis maybe just because they're a little bit easier to hold. Um, so that's what we go with. Um, we also use them in other education programming here at the museum too, so it's not solely um, for the mix, um, okay. but we do here. Um, as far as computers, I would say uh, we pretty much go with all laptops, um, and we have a few MacBooks, um, or a MacBook Air and a MacBook Pro. Um, we have a bunch of Lenovo's for the PC users. Um, a couple of those are touchscreen, a couple are not. Um, but I guess our thinking was we want a wide range. We want some for the Mac users, something for the PC users, so that everybody feels comfortable. Um, and obviously the Macs are going to be more expensive. Uh, the Lenovo's have a lower price point, so that's kind of nice too. We can get more computers, more Lenovo's with the same amount of money. And actually we see a lot of use from the Lenovo's. More of our students kind of gravitate towards the PC than they do the Mac. I don't know if that's because that's what they use every day or what, but that's what we're seeing. Um, we do have one iMac over there, and that's kind of our editing station um, with Photoshop and InDesign. And all of that software is set up on that computer. Um, and then we have the uh, the trash can looking MacBook Pro, that's you know kind of top of the line. Um, and just to to speak to something K5 said earlier, that's one purchase I think we might have jumped into a little too fast. Um, I think we're going to find a way to repurpose it. But what we we're using it for, you know, this this three thousand dollar computer that really was like one of my coworkers said kind of, you know, having a rocket ship when all you really need is, you know, a, a car engine or something like that. So um, we got a lot of computing power that is kind of sitting there dormant right now. Like I said, we're finding a way to repurpose that. But that was, you know, looking back at it, I think we caught, could have probably held off on that $3,000 Mac Pro, um, the newest version, uh, or something else, or maybe a couple other smaller computers. So. Well, um, I can go next. Um, so I also would like to echo the laptops over desktops thing. Um, I'm going to take you all on a field trip. So um, here in our lab, we have all these desktops, which we got really lucky um, to get because uh, one of our uh, parents, uh, is like he works in the IT department, and he salvaged all these desktops and gave them to us for free. And... Um, so that's that was nice. We didn't like we didn't really have to spend budget on that many computers. Um, but if I were to you know if we were to buy things, I'd rather buy laptops over desktops just because you can actually just walk around with it and um, you know um, and just the portability is kind of is is, is um, nearly priceless actually. Uh, the second thing we learned is that if we have an old computer, um, like an old PC especially, uh, and it's like sluggish. Uh, reformatting it actually makes it pretty brand new, so that's a free cost or free uh, uh, something you can do for free. Um, um, it only just takes time. Um, and then the last thing is, um, if there were to be, uh, if you're going to buy laptops, um, we, we did ha we do have a few laptops, but they were like the $400 laptops, and those are pretty much just paperweights. They only last like a year, and then after a year, they're pretty obsolete. So I would suggest to buy laptops that are around the $800 range, just so that they'll last you a little longer. 
Um, and then the only people who really need like powerful computers are the staff members. For example, I have a nice MacBook. My colleague has a nice uh, desktop, um, and um, and just just so that we can do like the more powerful things like video editing or you know those are the kinds of things that you know are required to help promote the, the space. Um, and like the kids don't really do it, but you know it's just really nice for the, to have the ability to do that as a staff member. So. That's it for me. So we also primarily use laptops in the space. Um, we are just directly on the library floor. So if we're using stationary computers, we'll use PCs that are in the library's computer lab. Um, the laptops, again, are great because you can move them around. Um, we, have, uh, we have Macs. And those are sometimes necessary for us because we do do a fair amount of um, editing and video production with the kids. And we recently swapped out the RAM on a couple of those machines because they're a little bit older at this point and sometimes just uh, swapping out the, the RAM or the memory can really make a di big difference in how those are operating. Um, we do also have a couple of, I believe they're also um, iPad 2s. Maybe they're iPad 3s. I think they're iPad 2s. Um, and we're potentially going to get some, some more tablets. I, at least for our programming, find the usefulness of those a little bit limited. The kids tend to associate it with the gameplay. And uh, as soon as they see an iPad, they just kind of want to get on there and mess around with, you know, whatever game. And it's a little bit distracting. Um, we do use them a lot for stop motion animation, which is really great. And uh, recently, one of our staff members, Kenny, has been trying out this, um, this new app for creating beats. I'm not going to remember what it is off the top of my head because it is pretty new thing that we're using, but um, the kids are really, really liking it. They're really engaged with that. Um, Sari, one thing that I remember us doing when I was at the free library was um, it seemed like we always, the more we were using iPads and our own phones, the more we needed some stable way to hold them in place, especially if we're doing stop motion. And so we ended up buying tripods for the iPads, or it was tripods with an iPad adapter, so that we were able to use the same tripod for video stuff and for doing um, green screen stuff as well. But then I think a couple of people at um, Maker John ended up making their own uh, tripods too, right? Or their own stands for stop motion? Yeah, I think that there was one that was made uh, with a laser cutter. And that one, that one works pretty well. I think that you could easily make a similar thing with uh, cardboard and even have that be a project that participants engage with. Um, it took us, I think, three rounds of purchasing to finally get tripod, tripod, tripod adapters for the iPad that actually fit properly. So it took us a little while to learn our lesson. Just buy the expensive kind. Don't try and buy like the cheapo ones coming direct from uh, the factory in China. They might say that they'll fit whatever model and give you the dimensions. They don't fit. Had the same thing with um, several camera batteries where they just are not at all what they're supposed to be. So just get, spend the extra $20, $30 and get, if you're going to buy them and not make them, just like get a top of the line adapter. Uh, so Thanks. one thing that I, I would like to just mention really quickly is that we, sorry Matt for cutting you off, um, <laughs> we have, we're, the reason, another reason I wanted to have this conversation is because we're, we've started this resource spreadsheet and it's on the community of practice site and I'll also put a link underneath this YouTube video. Uh, so it's a spreadsheet and it's all editable so anyone who logs into it can add 
line items, but I'd be really interested in seeing if there'd be some way, for example, Sarah, you said that there are tripods that you bought or tripod adapters that you bought that didn't fit and camera batteries that you bought that are off brand that didn't fit either or didn't work so well. And so I'm wondering if we can use this spreadsheet as a way to like be like, all right, you have, you know, a power shot S110. Uh, here are the batteries that are cheap that you can buy for that camera. Just so everyone would be able to like go straight to that URL and buy the things that fit. So, it, you know, the same thing with AJ mentioning, well, you can take an old laptop and you can reformat it and then it gives it a lot of extra life. Let's put in some resources where it would be like how to reformat old computers or how, like, you know, if you have this kind of computer, this is the kind of RAM that you need and here's a great tutorial on how to do it. Um, I have a, so the tripod and the iPad thing that... Um, I think Matt was talking about this earlier, but that's we've done that to make like a two second, you know, photo booth, and it's like super easy and like like big win, um, just to like because a lot of the you know the iPads and the iPhones and the Androids, we all have like internal like either camera fo camera apps or you can download a free photo booth app. Um, so if you just put that up, um, that's right there, a quick photo booth. Um, actually, I have. Uh, one other thing, um, let me see. Um, one, uh, we did. I'm gonna do a quick screen share. Another, another way to uh, to add this is if you uh, can. You guys see my screen? Yep. Mm -hmm. so if you guys go to like, if you just add a catch projector to the um, to the photo booth. Um, they have like you can, or to the to the you know, to the tablet. Um, what we did was we, we we did we had a little photo booth going on, and then we projected the picture onto a balloon, and then kids drew their faces, traced their faces on the balloon, and that was that was like a pumpkin sort of because it was for Halloween. Um, so that's another quick idea. Yeah. So. Cool. Mm -hmm. And. Can I jump in real quick, AJ? Yeah. Um, not to harp on iPads for too long. I know we got to move on to other things. But this is just uh, something we created to hold our iPads. Um, this was one of my fellow employees, Mike Mooring, created this. So he laser cut these top wooden pieces, bottom wooden pieces, and then used some uh, furniture um, bolts, um, pool noodles, um, and then like a little wooden casing in here. So he's basically, and then he put a mic stand up here, and then um, just a normal tripod uh, foot right here, so that you don't have to worry about finding, you know, the foot pad that you need to fit the specific tripod. This is just a, a standard camera tripod. Um, you know, one one thing I think we all see when people are filming with an iPad is that they cover up the lens um, with their finger, or they cover up the microphone with the hand. So with these two handles, we kind of eliminated those two issues, and we even gave them like some steady cam kind of motion with these things as they spin it. So um, a little bit more stability. But this is something that I, think I can get more and share on our resources page, so that you know, if you have a laser cutter, out and make it. So. Anyway, moving on. Enough about iPad. <laughs> That was really sweet, though, Matt. That was awesome. Uh, I guess I would like to hear a little bit about the kind of tools that you guys at Createch, Janosch, um, the kinds of tools that you use every day. And I know you ha have you just when have you opened up your space, and are you are opening new spaces. So I guess let's hear a little bit more about what's going on in St. Paul. So the Createch program has been going on for three years, and it started very heavily based on iPads. And just here, St. Paul Public Schools are starting to give out iPads to students. So um, the bread and butter of what we've been doing is um, no longer flashy. Uh, a, lot of these, a lot of our participants have iPads provided from their school. So we're really looking to expand what we offer, and we've been Find things left and right, but uh, I think we really need some time just to learn how to use some of the new stuff. 
and then uh, we have. I'm mostly here today because we end up with a heap of money left over from a building renovation that was really interested in hearing about possibilities for some high ticket items. Sure, I think that sounds great. So you cut in a little bit, but I heard that you're looking like you have a little bit of money left over and you are interested in buying more big ticket items. So let's talk about that. I know that a couple of you guys have, um, I guess maybe we can go down the line. How about something like that? And if you could recommend like what would be on your wish list if you had a few, let's say like, you know, a few, like a, a few thousand dollars to spend on something, what would you recommend to another site that they buy? Do you want to start, AJ? Uh, laser cutter. <laughs> but if that's too expensive, um, um, I'll come back. I don't know. That's my big wish. Do you want to say, because uh, I know that you guys do have a laser cutter. This was a conversation that we had on the COP, and a lot of people weighed in, which is really cool. Um, do you want to talk about which laser cutter you have and maybe the costs that are associated with it? Me? Oh, we yeah. actually don't have a laser cutter, but we um, we started, we bought um, like a subscription or uh, what is it, membership to a lab on on campus with a laser cutter, a fab lab on campus that had a laser cutter just because we were just kind of dying. We were, you know, just the time it takes to cut things out by hand versus just using a laser cutter, like, you know, you know it takes more like 10 minutes to cut something out on a laser cutter, but it takes, you know, um, you know probably like an hour or two hours to cut it out by hand. So, um, definitely recommend a laser cutter. I mean, we can't have a laser cutter here in the fall or in our state because it kind of require ventilation. So those are the hidden costs of laser cutters, it's like the ventilation plus or filter and all that stuff. But, um, so you said ventilation, right? Either it needs either ventilation or it needs a filter. Um, and filters are expensive too. Um, the other thing is that we noticed that the, what, what, what laser cutters do with the kids, at least, is that um, it takes out what we call the bad hard of making things by hand because kids, these days, like, kids don't actually, aren't very good at, like, you know, precisely cutting and, you know, cutting things out by hand with an exacto knife or with scissors either. And um, in order to actually build mechanical things or just, like, physical objects for precision, like, is, prob is, is probably the main main way of source of failure, I guess. And laser cutters basically like wipe precision, like that problem of precision out the door. So that's why I always, that's why I think that's the role of a laser cutter in the maker space. Because it gets rid of that bad hard um, and it makes it a good hard. So now like the good hard is like, oh wait, my parts just don't fit or my, actually, my you know, the thing that I'm designing doesn't do what it, I think it wants to do. And so I'm going to redesign it now, and that's a good that's a good problem. Whereas before, it's like I can't even cut this thing out. I don't know what to do. So, so that's my that's my that's my experience with laser cutters. Hi. Leo, would you talk about the recommendation that you would give a site that had a few extra dollars to spend? Let's see. How about that? I think the phone stopped ringing in my office. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we would really like 3D printer of various types. Like, we'd like a small one to kind of take out and mess around with. Um, we'd like one that was in sight. We'd like, you know, one that we could use multiple materials with. Um, we've talked with people about doing some that you can, you know, use food products with, and that's something that we would ha totally have on our wish list. We're also, the laser cutter thing would be great for us, but um, the same is true. It's going to require structural changes. It's going to require a lot of ventilation. And we've partnered with um, a group, Zero Craft, which is just down the road from us in, down, in the downtown area of Tucson. And they've got a laser cutter and um, a 3D printer. And so we've been doing programs back and forth. Um, so it would be awesome to have a laser cutter, but I just don't see it happening for us right now. I mean, it would be great. But I definitely, the kids have been having a lot of fun with the 3D printer. Um, they've just been doing a lot of really cool things with it. I would love to have one in our space. So, 
Yeah, we can't afford laser cutter here, but I really wish we could. <laughs> <laughs> same here, same here. I'm like, well, just break a few windows. We don't care. The kids will have a few, a few fumes. That's not going to kill them. <laughs> Matt, do you want to talk about what we would be on your wish list? Um, yeah. Um, right now, I really want to buy this five thousand dollar hovercraft kit. Um, that's only fifty percent a joke. I think it would be a lot of fun uh, to do that. But that, all jokes aside, I do want to buy that. But that you know probably doesn't fit the learning lab model. Um, we do have, we're lucky enough to get some 3D printers from a grant um, through 3D Systems. Um, you know, so we didn't have to pay for those necessarily, but there are, you know, other costs associated with that, with the, like the plastic filaments, um, replacement parts, and in our case, uh, adhesive for the build plate because we don't have a heated build plate. Um, so we have those, but I would definitely recommend that if you have the money, you try to get yourself a 3D printer. Um, maybe like you were saying, a small one that you know you could take out and maybe set up around the museum, around the library, wherever you are, um, like a, like a peachy printer. And I think they're about two hundred bucks or something. Um, and then maybe have a bigger variety. So that's we've gotten a lot of good use from our three D printers. I would say they get a lot of attention. If nothing else, people walk by and they see a three D printer and they're like, "Whoa, we gotta check out this space." So um, that's really good and. Something else that we've been happy with um, that weren't as expensive as the 3D printers, but um, some $300 around there drones, or I guess I should say quadrocopters. They're not exactly drones. I don't want people to think that you know they're military style, but our our quadrocopters have been a big hit as well um, because they really kind of give us this presence around the museum. If we have an outside event, we take them outside and we fly them around. Um, we can use them in our AV. Uh, stuff as well because they come with two cameras on board. So I think those would be my two biggest recommendations. 3D printers and some kind of decent sized powder copter. Can I say something about 3D printers? Um, what I noticed is that I think the, if the role of the laser cutter is to get rid of like the bad heart of fabrication, I think the role of a 3D printer in a learning lab is to provide a hook to kids. And, like That's how you draw them in. Um, frankly, I don't think I don't ever see. I haven't seen kids really like go deep into the design or the making with 3D printers. All they do is uh, they keep making little trinkets. Um, Paulo Blickstein, he has a paper about this. He calls it uh, the keychain effect. That kids they see things like this and they end up just making little keychains, and that's as far as they go. But um, but um, and so like they don't ever really go dig deep into like the geeking out, you know. Uh, it's hard to get them past the messing around with, with a 3D printer, but it's definitely an easy way to like keep them into the lab and to be like, now you want to do some more. <laughs> so I think that's the role. That's what I've learned is the role of our 3D printer. And we have a little one, like you know, two five hundred dollars. I think that's definitely definitely true, AJ. I think you kind of have to be careful. It could just become kind of a gimmick for your space. Um, so yeah, definitely we've seen that. There's, you know, we have certain mixed members who only print off things from Thingiverse, um, or we have certain mixed members who design everything themselves and refuse to print out something unless they designed it, which is great. That's what we're we're going after. So yeah, definitely something to think about. Um, but I think yeah, as far as drawing them in, and then what we do, I guess, to alleviate, hopefully eliminate that product problem. Excuse me, is um. You know, we, we do a lot of our geeking out. It's kind of more focused heavily on here's how you 3D design using Tinkercad. So we'll look at Tinkercad one month, and then we'll look at Sculptress the next month and try to give them a little bit more in-depth knowledge through that geeking out workshop um, so that they don't just go on to Thingiverse or, you know, design tiny little things for, like you said, the keychain effect. So I think very valid point that we should certainly be aware of. Yeah. Janusz, did you want to talk about the ideas that you have for things that um, you're thinking of purchasing with your extra money? Well, we, we seriously have money to really think about a laser cutter here, um, but I haven't looked into it much, so I definitely need some ideas of what are the other things about that. I'm hearing ventilation or filters, software, and 
has any knowledge of particular models to be scoping would help me a lot. And that's also something that we're having a conversation on the COP about, and I've been emailing with some other people about. So maybe what I can do is um, we can start up that conversation thread again on the COP, and I can have those people dump their responses on there. There are some other uh, material stuff associated with um, laser cutters in terms of maintenance, like the tube needing to be placed or getting the filter cleaned out regularly and those are kinds of expenses that if you're not anticipating them will run you about five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars so other things that you might need to pad in and be aware of when you're thinking about um, making a big purchase like a laser cutter. Bigger laser cutters also require air compressors. Um, I, the one thing that I would like to um, just mention really briefly is I, so I visited the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in March and uh, I visited the home of one of the mentor, like the main mentor there and he had actually built his own laser cutter. So it's called, a, it's based on this model called the laser sore and I think when you source all of the parts it costs about $2,000 or something like that and I mean this was in his garage. The ventilation was basically I don't know, like something that you would see coming out of a dryer and that was just going out like the front of his garage. But it was huge. I mean, it was the size of like a full size bed. It was enormous. And he had built it all himself and it, it was a really amazing project. So a lot of these things, there are open source versions that are much cheaper. For example, the RepRap is uh, about $600. There are different models of it, but it's a 3D printer that you make on your own. And we had bought one at the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'll put these resources in um, the YouTube also. We had bought one at the Free Library of Philadelphia. There was one mentor who had built his own rep wrap, and he worked with some of the kids at the Kensington Library, Kensington Library to build it with them. But the problem was when he left, he also took all of his expertise with him. And I mean, this is the case with just, you know, even basic 3D printers in some libraries. Once the person who knows how to use it leaves, they take their expertise with them. So just one caveat, if you decide to go the open source hardware route, it's um, a much steeper learning curve because you know all of the parts are just there. It's not very user friendly, and just a just a a nod to make sure you have your professional development in place when you buy these things. Um, because we only have a little bit of time left, I was hoping maybe Salvador and Sarah, you could talk about uh, the items that you would purchase. Go ahead, Sarah. <clears throat> Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm going to mostly defer to Salvador because the the culture of our space is so not about big tech and hasn't been that it's hard for me to even imagine what we would buy. Um, I guess the only thing that I would say would be like maybe more more around furniture and um, around actually building out the space that we work in to be more functional and uh, having the ability to have like really permanent stations for things and more lockable storage um, and ways to secure some supplies so that we can have them out on the floor more or um, to have kits that we can lock away that kids can take out and use independently if um, they've gotten, you know, like a little certification to be able to use said tool or said uh, tool set. Um, the other thing is that I know that often when we're making these large purchases and these large tech purchases, um, there's a certain amount of time that we're given to do that. So it's like, okay, you have to spend X amount of dollars by September 3rd or whenever that is. If at all possible, you can make these purchases in a way that's staggered so that you can see what's working and what's not working instead of having to make um, like just these big budget purchases all at once 
and then maybe you end up making a lot of those mistakes or getting a lot of those things that you find to be pretty regrettable afterwards. Um, just any any time that you can take your time in doing that is do, just do it. <laughs> it's a good idea. Uh, so this is Salvador. I'm going to now hand it off to you. Thank you, Sari. Um, we have um, pretty much all the equipment that we need to run. Um, I'm going to speak to um, the Learn to DJ. We have uh, five stations, uh, five laptops, five controllers, five headphone sets. Uh, one is the master unit that has speakers, microphones, uh, PS3, uh, a monster TV so that people could see what um, the DJ is actually doing. So we're pretty um, much set up for a good um, Learn to DJ studio space. Uh, the room's about 20 by 20. Um, square feet and um, even though it's small a lot of magical things do happen in that room uh, we have professional lights that were installed um, on the ceiling um, that illuminate the whole room so we're set I think the next step that would be a monster purchase would be to buy a, um, a monster Mac so that people can or so that youth can start um, creating their own music um, we'll use something called Ableton. Um, you install it on the Mac computer, and then kids can start creating their own music and um, and DJing to their own music when we do live events at parks or schools or at expos. So um, something like that would be in the probably five thousand um, dollar ballpark figure. Um, buying the Mac, the software, uh, some studio monitors, speakers, um, a microphone things of that nature. So that's, our, I think, our next big step, um, buying one station that where kids can make um, their own music. Yeah, I think um, that would be probably the thing that if I had the money and if I was still at the library that I would be really interested in purchasing is more equipment for making music. I mean, I think that that's also like a 3D printer, a really amazing hook to get kids in is by, you know, a party. So that's what I would spend money on, either that or um, video equipment, which is another thing that we didn't really talk about. Um, so we have about a few minutes left. I guess, is there anything else that you guys wanted to talk about? Any purchases that you made that you loved? Anything that you wish you had not bought? You know what, can I do real, real quick? Um, something that we've learned is um, instead of buying a very fancy camcorder or even a camera, uh, we decided to go with a GoPro. <laughs> um, it, it has its pros and cons, but um, you know the teens could attach it to their heads. They could attach it to their um, body, uh, and if and if, especially if they're doing live performances, they could actually see the recording the crowd. Um, then when we come back and reflect, it's a good way for them to see themselves and if the crowd is responding or not responding. So a GoPro is very small, four hundred dollar budget. Um, no software required, or you could download it for free. But um, I think it gives you a, a good little bang for your buck. Um, are there better technologies out there? Probably. But um, a GoPro, like I said, you could put it on your wrist, your head, um, almost anywhere, or even on a tripod. Um, and, and that's a good way of archiving your performance and um, the people that you're DJing to. And then you could reflect and, and have serious conversations. So that's just um, you no need to buy a super fancy camcorder or you know reporters um, so we totally, we totally see the same thing uh, we, we figured out that same exact thing at here at the tech hive um, Matt my colleague Matt he he has like you know DSLR and he spent like two years trying to train our teams how to like use the DSLR focus all that stuff and we still ended up with crappy video like or just video that's like unusable whereas if you just Matt, like he just you know finally put a GoPro in the kids hands and they're like oh and you know they're doing all like the GoPro takes away all those bad hards of, of of filmmaking. Like you don't have to worry about lighting, you don't have to worry about focusing. You can actually work on composition and telling the story, and then like getting an interesting angle and all that stuff. And and it's like a it's a I think it I think a GoPro is kind of like the makey makey of videos. Like it's a really easy entry level, good thing to get started with um, with the whole making of the video. Um, the other thing I like to use is uh, your own phone. And we actually encourage all our kids because they all have technology like that's really fancy in their pocket, and so instead of 
buying cameras, we tell them you need a, the expectation is that, that they make their own videos on their own phone, and then we help them download it onto the computers and, and we upload it there. So. Yeah, I can uh, testify to all of the kids at Lawrence Hall using GoPros. Um, so I was there over the weekend for a training, and um, so we were making the stuff using the Hummingbird Robotics Kit, and one of the kids just had a GoPro, and he was moving it around, and then at one point he put it down on the table that I was working at with somebody else, put it on a piece of paper, and created his own dolly by just dragging it across the table. And I was like, that's going to be a beautiful shot. It's going to just be like really clean and a really amazing pan, and it's just like the GoPro and a piece of paper. I really like the inventiveness. Uh, anything else that you guys wanted to say? Last minute, buy this, don't buy this. I'm just curious, um, when Salvador was speaking a second ago, it made me think of some stuff. Um, you know, we've been thinking about a sound booth, and I was curious if anybody has a sound booth or experience with sound booths and uh, what they might recommend. Uh, you know what? Uh, we, one of our libraries does have a professional sound booth. Um, unfortunately, due to the budget cuts, it's not currently being used. Um, and good thing you brought that up. My DJ studio is not um, soundproofed, so um, it's you could hear it throughout the library. Um, and that would be probably something where I would invest um, by adding some padding. Um, but again, uh, we do have the money, but um, Padding for soundproof in a room is very, very expensive. Um, so we have to decide soundproof or buy the like the Big Mac with Ableton. So I'm gonna um, purchase the equipment because that's what the teams. I mean, I think need more. They might use that more than um, I would rather it deal with complaints of being too loud and have the kids enjoy the the computer. So that's how I justify not soundproofing it and, and buying the equipment that they either need or want. Um, we have a sound booth. Um, we bought this like $900 sound booth. It's like it comes in a box kind of like Ikea style. And um, it doesn't actually soundproof anything, but what it does is it like, it does two things. It it like gets rid of like background hums because we have like AC vents and all that stuff. And as you can see, we have like little... Um, padding right here that it comes with. It's like super cheap and like kind of, but the more important thing that it does is it, it like, it, it's like a psychological thing. The moment you put a kid inside this box, they're like, they totally take everything seriously. And it's just an acrylic box in the middle of, of the room. <laughs> so. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we just have really, uh, we have our AV studio set up with, you know, great green screen. We have all the video equipment, so we can do a lot of really cool broadcasting or recording a video, but um, the HVAC system behind it gives it this pretty nasty hum. So even if we're just doing voiceovers for videos um, and not music you know, necessarily, uh, we still have to, you know, really go into the post-edit and get rid of all that noise and as best we can, which is sometimes pretty hard, so... Yeah, thank you. That that'll help when I'm thinking about sound booth, that sound booth or soundproofing. Almost two o'clock. Can't talk. All right. Well, let's be sure to take all of these resources. What I can do is circle back with you guys and just make sure that we have links to everything that we talked about. And I feel like there are there were several people who wanted to make this call. Jennifer Greenlee from the San Francisco Public Library, who they're going to be opening their space and have been making a lot of purchases lately. Um, uh, Trisha from U Media Hartford, um, Lindsay Runyon from uh, uh, Multnomah in Portland, Oregon. So I wonder if maybe this is a conversation we can have again, or we can deepen and get into some more details about other tools and materials that we all use and love to use. Um, cool. So we'll post this and we'll post that Google spreadsheet with all the tools and materials, but. Hopefully this has been helpful to you guys. Most definitely. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone. Bye.